Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we need to make sure we're ready to uh, study the word, take some time to make sure that we are in fellowship. Scripture says if we regard iniquity in our heart, the Lord will not hear us. This indicates that, as we'll see uh, in our study ongoing study tonight on the offerings and sacrifices in Leviticus, that whenever there is sin in the life, it renders the believer experientially unclean, out of fellowship, walking in the darkness rather than walking in the light. And so there has to be a process of cleansing. And that is an experiential cleansing based on the reality of our positional cleansing that we already have because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And every dispensation has different uh, means of bringing about that, uh, that cleansing. So we'll, uh, for church age, 1 John 1, 9, we just confess our sins to the Lord, and then we will, uh, in the privacy of our priesthood, and then I'll open in prayer. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and then I'll open. Let's pray. Father, as we read your word, we're impressed with who you are as a God who is holy, righteous, God who has perfect integrity, and a God who cannot be tainted by sin. And yet you have created us with volition, volition that allowed for the fall of man, and in your grace you've provided a perfect solution to that sin problem. And you have provided ongoing solution based on Christ's work on the cross for our day-to-day sins that we commit each day that breach our fellowship with you. Father, as we study these doctrines related to the sacrifices and offerings in Leviticus, we pray that they might not just be a historical study, but recognize that these foreshadow the work of Christ on the cross, and they also exemplify principles that are just as much true today as they were in the Old Testament period. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 5. Leviticus chapter 5. And we're going to continue our study on the tabernacle. Now, we're in a study on Hebrews, just in case somebody happens to tune in and go, wait a minute, I think we're studying Hebrews on Thursday night. We're not studying Leviticus. But we are studying Hebrews, and in Hebrews chapter 9... The focus is on the tabernacle. There we go. See, during all that time, my computer had to rebound, and so I was just waiting for it to go through the whole process of getting cleansed of its sins. And Now it works. So we've been studying the, the tabernacle and um, the furniture in the tabernacle. We started off looking at the outer courtyard and the curtains around the outer courtyard, looking at the spiritual principles that are exemplified in the construction of the tabernacle, the materials that are used, everything just about within the tabernacle is designed to teach something about the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ through various visual aids. And it's interesting to just stop and think about why in the world did God do this? Why didn't God come along and just uh, spell things out for people? Why didn't he 
send the Lord Jesus Christ sometime back in the Old Testament period? Why did he wait almost at, or at least 4,000 years from the fall of Adam until the time when Christ finally came? What are the implications of Galatians 4.4 that it was in the fullness of time that God sent his son? And so there's a plan And God is doing something in that process of time in order to prepare the human race and in order to teach certain things about who he is, about the basic problem that man has, which is sin, and about how that affects man's relationship with God. And we see exemplified throughout the Levitical offerings, the sacrifices and offerings, this whole principle of the creator-creature distinction. And as we're looking at Leviticus, and we're looking at Leviticus because Leviticus describes all of the procedures and protocols for entering into ceremonial fellowship with God. And I stress that because there's a difference, and we'll see a little bit of that in one passage that we're looking at tonight. There's a difference between the experiential fellowship of the everyday believer in the Old Testament on the one hand and his ceremonial approach to God on the other hand. And I think most Christians, when we read through the Old Testament, get the impression that, well, you can't have fellowship with God unless you bring a sacrifice to the tabernacle or to the temple. And, of course, that would create something of a logistical problem because the land is quite large. You have uh, Dan, which is all the way in the north, and that would take several several days by foot, probably a couple of weeks by foot, or by uh, horseback or donkey. It would still take three or four days to make the journey from Dan down to Jerusalem, or if you're all the way in the south in the Negev or Beersheba, Arad, somewhere like that, it would still take several days to get up to Jerusalem. And if every time you sinned, you had to go to the tabernacle or the temple and uh, sacrifice, and you might spend most of your time just going from the central part of Jerusalem to the outer border and then back without ever getting outside of Jerusalem itself. And a lot of Christians experience that as you're in and out of fellowship frequently. So it helps us to understand the difference between what we might call real fellowship or experiential fellowship and ceremonial fellowship. And in the ceremony or the ritual of the Old Testament, the Mosaic Law, we see depicted in the sacrifices and offerings the reason for uh, having to confess sin in the spiritual life and how sin is dealt with. Because God is of such a nature that he is completely distinct from man. He is holy. So the key word in the book of Leviticus is the word holiness or holy based on the uh, Greek, I mean, excuse me, the Hebrew word kadash, which means not just, it's usually translated holy, but that's such a jargon religious word that's used by so many people and they don't know what it means that it loses its real impact. The word holy really means to be something that is set apart to God and when it is applied to God it has this idea that God is himself set apart, that he is distinct or unique. He is totally apart from the creation and so this is one of the reasons we emphasizes the doctrine of the creator-creature distinction, that God as the creator is totally distinct, totally apart from everything in creation. He is the God who made the heavens, the earth, and all that is in them. And so this is exemplified in the very structure of the tabernacle, that there is a distance and a separateness between God and man. And in order to come into the presence of God, in order to have fellowship with God, there must be a cleansing from sin. And that the sacrifices depict not only the uh, work of Christ on the cross as it provides a positional cleansing, but also the ongoing cleansing that must take place in the life of the believer. And often when we 
studied this, and maybe in the past when you've studied the uh, sacrifices and offerings in Leviticus, you think that certain sacrifices or certain offerings were salvation-related or depicted specifically what Christ did on the cross, and then there were other sacrifices that had to do with the uh, post-salvation spiritual life confession and, and growth. But in reality... All of the sacrifices depict both. And what, I, what we see when we look at it that way is that the foundation for all cleansing, the foundation for, air, for dealing with sin is the work of Christ on the cross and that actual judgment that takes place. This is why in 1 John 1, 7, John says, for the blood of Christ, and that term means the death of Christ, for the blood of Christ cleanses, present tense, so it's a continuous action there. The blood of Christ continually cleanses from all sin. That's the positional, so we can call that positional cleansing uh, that takes place at the instant we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This is why Paul can talk about we have redemption, the comma, the forgiveness of sins. This is a positional forgiveness because of our place in Christ, and we are positionally sanctified, set apart to God. The word sanctified, and that whole word group, sanctified, saint, all of this uh, sanctification, all of those words come out of that same word group for holy. So they all have to do with being set apart for the service of God. And as you approach the the tabernacle, we see that there's only one way into the presence of God. And what this tells us is God, as the one who's at the center, is the one who defines who he is and how the creature can come into his presence and what the problem is. The problem is not defined by the worshiper. The worshiper doesn't come in and say, well, I feel good today so I can come in and worship God. Or I feel, isn't it a wonderful day and I'm just so filled with enthusiasm for God that isn't he blessed to have me come and be able to sing praises for him today? And I'm being facetious because that's a dominant attitude that we find today among many Christians is as though God somehow is privileged to have us come and worship him. Isn't it wonderful? And there's no understanding of the underlying dynamics related to sin and cleansing and uh, the basic doctrines of justification, reconciliation, atonement. All of these things just get lost in terms of being able to experience a wonderful, warm relationship with Jesus based on our, how we feel about things on Sunday morning. So the tabernacle is a great illustration of the fact that God has to be approached on the basis of set rules that he establishes. And that's not legalism. Some people would say, well, that's, that's legalism. No. Legalism is saying that uh, God blesses me on the basis of what I do. This is saying, this is the grace of God saying that God has provided a way whereby despite sin, we can come into his presence and we can have fellowship with him and we can worship him. And he's the one who does all of the work we simply follow his directions and so that we can avail ourselves of the work that he has done. So we started <clears throat> looking at the tabernacle because this becomes the foundation. And the, the tabernacle, the furniture in the tabernacle, the things that go on in the tabernacle in terms of the sacrifices and offerings, the priesthood, become the foundation for what the writer of Hebrews is going to develop in the section that we're in in Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. So without a familiarity with the ritual and with the function of the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament, we're going to get lost when we go through uh, Hebrews 9 and 10. So we're taking time to go back and look at these things. The first uh, piece of furniture that we see when we go into the tabernacle is the brazen altar. And so right now we're looking at what takes place at the brazen altar. And the, bra- the altar itself is the place of judgment. That's what an altar represented. Something is being sacrificed there. Something is being judged there. The, in the burnt offering, which is the first offering that's mentioned in Leviticus chapter 1, 
the entire sacrifice is being consumed by fire. And so the altar has to be of bronze so that it can withstand the heat of the judgment. And we, I pointed out that that is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is able to withstand the judgment of sin because of who he is and his person, that he is the, he is the God-man. So the a brazen altar represents the fact that as God in his deity, he is able in his perfection, he is able to uh, handle the judgment that is placed upon him. The second offering that we looked at is the meal offering, sometimes called the gift or tribute offering in that's described in Leviticus chapter two. This is a bloodless offering where uh, raw grain was offered that had been mixed with oil was one form of that. Another form is that they would mix it with oil or they would uh, grill it or pan fry it. No leaven or honey was to be used. It was to be from the first fruits of the um, the harvest, and it was to be seasoned with salt as a reminder of the permanence of God's covenant uh, with Israel. And I pointed out also that towards the end of Leviticus chapter 2, There's the emphasis on the roasted grain offering, and I commented that if you look carefully at your text, it indicates that God at least has southern taste. Some somebody from up in New York emailed me and said, "Hey, I live north of the Mason-Dixon line, but I like grits." (laughs) God likes grits, so that's uh, that's in the New American Standard. I'm not sure how the uh, some of the other translations translate that, but it must have been a southerner who uh, translated that. Uh, in terms of the roast. So the uh, the meal offering is a memorial uh, to God's grace, and it is a fellowship offering because the meal itself is then shared between the offerer and the priest. Sometimes there would even be a number of people who would eat together, and so it is a fellowship uh, offering. Then you have the peace offering, which is described In chapter 3, that's also known as a fellowship offering where, excuse me, I was getting ahead of myself. This is the offering where the believer shares a meal with others in the tabernacle to celebrate the peace with God that was made possible by by the death of a sacrifice. The previous offering when I mentioned was that the... In the, in the meal offering, a portion was given to the priest, which dis, was uh, indicated the sufficiency of God's grace for all. In the peace or fellowship offering, then there is a meal that is shared with others, emphasizing the celebration of God's peace that is the believers because it, the sin problem has been, has been solved. And a key word that is used in the peace offering is the word salam, which is where we get the word shalom. It's all etymologically related, which emphasizes uh, emphasizes peace. Then the fourth offering, which we looked at during the last lesson, is the sin offering. And the emphasis here is on the word hata, which is the Hebrew word for sin, which means to miss a mark. It is used in a literal sense in the book of Judges to describe the accuracy of the uh, archers and or the sling, slingers, I guess you would say, in, uh, the, in, among Benjamin, that they would not miss their target. They were extremely, uh, extremely accurate. Now, these last two offerings both focus on the whole doctrine of cleansing from sin uh, after salvation, so they depict in the Old Testament the same principle that is taught in the New Testament in First John one nine, and at the get, at the offering when the offering is made, there is a conf- there's a confession of sin. There's also uh, in the description of the text that when someone sins, they confess their sin, and then they bring. The offering, so the confession of sin can take place with the sin offering at the time of the offering, but with the guilt offering, it's done, there's a separation in time, which indicates what I was pointing out in the introduction is that the individual believer, for example, if David is out with his sheep 
in the fields of Bethlehem and he commits some sin, then he can confess that sin and be restored to fellowship in terms of his personal spiritual life. But then the next time he goes to the temple in Jerusalem, he needs to bring an offering, and that would be the sin offering or the trespass offering. Now, when we look at the sin offering that's described in chapter 4, this goes from chapter 4, verse 1, down through 5, 13. And we covered most of this last time, so I'm not going to go into all the details, but the text will describe this in terms of the different people, uh, the different uh, individuals that are involved. And it depends on where you fit within society in terms of leadership responsibility, for one thing, as to what sacrifice needs to be brought. The sin that is in focus in the sin offering is the sin of, uh, sin of unintentionality, where someone commits a sin, according to verse 2, if a person sins unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord, which ought not to be done, does any of them, uh, if, they're an, if it's anointed priest, this is um, from verses 3 through 12, talks about what happens if you're a priest, verses 13 to 21, if you're the congregation as a whole, Uh, Verses 22 to 26, the sin offering in relationship to a ruler. And verses 27 to 35, if you're just an everyday uh, believer in the nation Israel. And so different, uh, different offerings are prescribed for each of those particular, each of those particular sins. And in the process of those sacrifices, with the exception of the uh, one with the pigeons or turtle doves, where the priest would be the one to uh, break the neck of the uh, pigeon or, or uh, break the neck of the bird, then what you see is the individual, or in the case of the congregational sin, the elders laying hands on the head of the animal, indicating an identification with that animal. That animal, the sin is transferred from the person to the animal, and the animal becomes the substitute payment for the sin of the individual so that they are forgiven on the basis of that sacrifice. Now, that forgiveness is ultimately based on what that sacrifice represents, and that's the uh, work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So we covered that last time in chapter 4, and now we're in chapter 5. Chapter 5 is sometimes, uh, if you look, for example, in my New King, New King James translation, the heading above the first verse is the trespass offering. Actually, uh, the trespass offering is not uh, defined until verse 15 or 14. Verses 1 through 13 continue to talk about the sin offering. If you look at verse 1, we read, If a person sins in hearing the utterance of an oath and is a witness, whether uh, whether he has seen or known of the matter, if he does not tell it, he bears guilt. And this is the sin of someone who... Uh, maintains their silence rather than speaking up. So it's a sin of omission rather than a sin of commission. And it's the person then bears guilt. And so you look at that word guilt. See, the trespass offering is actually should be called the guilt offering. You have the sin offering and the guilt offering. The word that's translated um, translated. Uh, Trespass offering is really the Greek or the Hebrew word asham, and that has the idea of the someone who is guilty, someone who has violated the law, and that is a different word than the word that is translated guilt in verse one in probably the King James and as well as the New King James. The word that is translated guilt at the end of verse one is the Hebrew word avon which means iniquity or transgression. So that should be translated if a person sins, and that's the Hebrew word hata, in hearing the utterance of an oath and is a witness. So this is dealing with that, the commandment not to bear false witness, and this person could witness of something that he knew, but he keeps his, 
keep silent rather than speaking up. If this person sins in hearing the utterance of an oath, uh, something he has seen or knows about, and he doesn't speak up, he is a transgressor, literally, avon. He has committed iniquity. He has transgressed the law. So just because he, he hasn't overtly committed false witness, by not speaking up, he has. So he is therefore guilty of violating the law. What we see in these first 13 verses here of Leviticus chapter 5 is other forms of, of sin, of of um, inadvertent sins, sins of omission that all fall under the category of the of the sin offering. So under the f- first point, just trying to summarize this in a couple of points, the guilt here is described by the Hebrew word avon, meaning uh, iniquity, punishment of sin, or transgression. So the focal point is on the fact that the law has been violated, once again, the standard of God. And then you have various examples given, beginning in verse 2, going down through verse 13, of different ways in which uh, this may take place. You have the description in the first verse of someone who commits a false witness by maintaining silence. They just don't speak up. Or, and also in verse, uh, then in verse 2, the act of a person who touches any unclean thing. Now, there's a difference between a sin, which is a violation of of God's character, and the first verse where you don't speak up and you're uh, you're committing an infraction of the law uh, or uh, committing a sin, and someone who's committing an infraction of the law by touching an unclean thing. Touching an unclean animal... The carcass, a dead body, any of these things are not in and of themselves sins. There's nothing moral or immoral about touching a dead body or um, touching a carcass, touching an unclean animal. But it, it the, usually the animal is related to something dead. You have a dead carcass. Where does death come from? Physical death is a consequence of sin. You have... Uh, unclean animals are usually animals that eat carrion. So you have shrimp, lobster, or you have uh, swine that uh, who knows what they eat, different things of this nature. And so because the animal is associated with death, eats things that have already died, that renders them unclean. So the purpose of this is to demonstrate once again, that God can't have anything to do with sin. And it's a reinforcement for the Jew that anything that that is touched by sin causes him to be separated from God. And I know sometimes I've heard people say over the years that, why do I need to confess all my sin? I just spend all my time being focusing on all this sin in my life, and I just get totally absorbed with that. Well, some people can carry it too far, and we've all known people who've done that, and they just sit around all day trying to figure out all the different sins they committed. And the principle in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, whatever we're aware of at the time, then God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, that is those five or six or three or four that we remembered, and then he cleanses us from all other unrighteousness. So you don't have to sit around and keep a grocery list running and become obsessive about trying to name every single sin that you can possibly think of that you committed over the last 15 minutes since the last time uh, you confessed your sin. And uh, But the point here is it's a constant reminder to people that sin is pervasive. That's why you have these images like leaven. Leaven is a picture of sin because it just takes a little bit of leaven, and then it permeates all uh, when it's spread into the into the flour. It permeates everything, and so it's a reminder to the people of the sinfulness of sin and the distinctiveness of God, and that if there's even the least little bit of sin on the part of the worshiper, then they are they are prohibited from coming into the presence of God. And this gets reinforced in some pretty strong ways in the Old Testament in the early stages. I think it's interesting that when you have a dispensational shift that takes place, 
there are some extreme ways in which God reinforces the new principles in the new dispensation. For example, when Ananias and Sapphira lie about uh, the, the money that they're going to give to the church, Barnabas had sold a bunch of property and Barnabas gave uh, money to the church and everybody was probably talking about how wonderful and gracious Barnabas was because he gave so much money to the church. And so... Uh, uh, Ananias and Sapphira thought, well, wouldn't that be nice to have all of that adulation and praise? So we'll sell, sell our property, and then we'll tell everybody that we gave it all to the church. But they didn't give it all. They held some back. And so God, the Holy Spirit, killed them instantly for lying to the Holy Spirit. Now, why doesn't that happen all the time? That's not normative. If that were normative, we would probably have very empty churches around the world. So God was reinforcing a principle of not lying, reinforcing the principle of sanctity at the beginning of the dispensation. And you have a similar example that I'll go to uh, to illustrate this in the Old Testament, that God makes it clear that sin has an effect not just on us, but it permeates uh, everything around us. So in verse 2, one of the examples of a, the need for a sin offering is the touching of anything unclean, un, t- touching an unclean thing, uh, whether it's the carcass of an unclean beast, the carcass of unclean livestock, the carcass of unclean creeping things, and he is unaware of it. He shall also be uh, unclean and guilty. So this deals with a sin that you may not even be aware of, yet nevertheless, it still renders you unclean and guilty. And the same word in the Greek is found there. That's the word avon, meaning a tra- he has transgressed the, the law. Or under verse 3, if he touches human uncleanness, whatever uncleanness with which a man may be defiled and he is unaware of it, when he realizes it, then he shall be guilty. And this is later spelled out in other portions of the Mosaic Law, different ways in which a human is rendered Uh, ritually unclean, a woman when she gives birth to a child, uh, other things that take place render them, uh, render people ceremonially unclean. Verse 4, if a person swears, and this is not using profanity, this is the swearing of an oath in a any kind of judicial set, uh, judicial setting, whether it's the signing of a contract, entering into a legal relationship, if anyone swears, speaking thoughtlessly with his lips, to do evil or to do good. I mean, it's, it's just whether you, you're going to take a certain course of action, whether it's going to buy a house, buy a car, buy a camel, whatever it might be, then if you enter into this contract and you say, yes, I will do something, and then you didn't think it through and you realize you go home and you think about it and you think, oh, I really can't do that, and so now you're not going to keep your word, keep your contract, that would be a violation of of this particular uh, situation. If a person swears, speaking thoughtlessly with his lips to do evil or do good, whatever it is that a man may pronounce by an oath, and he is unaware of it, when he realizes it, then he shall be guilty in any of these things. So the idea here is that we need to be people of our word. Our word is our bond. That used to be true uh, in this country 40 or 50 years ago, and now it's not true anymore. And even if it is true of you, it's not true of anybody else. So you can get in a lot of trouble if you think that uh, you're... Uh, word is your bond, and you, that's that's good enough to go by. So the emphasis here is that each person should not make a commitment, say they're going to do something, promise something, indicate a, a course of action unless they're going to go through with it. In the in the uh, New Testament, in James, James says, "Let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay." And the point is to make sure that when you say you will do something, that you will uh, carry it out. Verse 5, it should be when he's guilty in any of these matters, he shall confess that he has sinned in these things. So here's the point of confession. When there's a realization of this sin, then you confess it. And verse 6 follows after that, and he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for his sin, which he has committed. And this offering could be a female lamb or 
a kid of the goats as your sin offering. So you, it primarily focuses on that, but there's always a grace provision for those who are poor and those who can't afford to bring the lamb or the kid, then they are to uh, bring a, a, either two turtle doves or two young pigeons. This is described in verse 11. He, if, it, if he's not able to, or excuse me, this is described in um, verse 8. Verse 7 and 8, if he's not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring to the Lord for his trespass, which he committed two turtle doves or two young pigeons. One is a sin offering, the other is a burnt offering. He shall bring them to the priest who shall offer that which is for the sin offering first and wring off its head. So one goes as a sin offering, the other goes as a burnt offering. And then when you get down to verse 11, if you're still so poor that you can't bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, which means you're extremely impoverished, then he who sins shall bring for his offering a tenth of an ephah, a fly, fine flour. And an ephah is generally described as like a bushel and a half or other sources say it's approximately five gallons. There's a certain amount of un- uncertainty that we have as to exactly how some of these uh, measure, dry measurements uh, equate to our English measurements. But if he couldn't afford that, then he is to bring... Uh, fine flour as a sin offering, and the fine flour emphasizes the uh, value of the flour. It is a more more valuable than your uh, everyday uh, flour. He shall put no oil on it, nor shall he put frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. Then he shall bring it to the priest. The priest takes his handful as a memorial portion, burns it on the altar according to the offerings made by fire to the Lord as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him. Now, this word atonement is one that we have almost been trained to think of in terms of a soteriological term. And we often refer to the death of Christ on the cross as atonement. There's a big debate uh, theologically in history called, oh, over limited or unlimited atonement. But there is no comparable word for atonement in the New Testament, as we, in any of Paul's literature, any of the New Testament literature describing the cross. Atonement was an Old Testament concept, and the Hebrew word is kafar. The English word atonement is a invented word that was coined in the 9th or 10th century A.D., indicating the concept of bringing two things together so that they are at one meant. That is where the word atonement comes from, this English concept. And so for a lot of, uh, lot of, uh, a lot of time that you've heard atonement taught, you'll hear it compared to covering, that kafar means covering. You look it up in some of the older Hebrew dictionaries, it will list the term kafar as covering. And there is a use of a word, K-P-H, it's a P actually, but it's usually a soft P, uh, K-P-R, that is used in Genesis chapter uh, 6 and 7 when it describes Noah uh, putting pitch to cover the ark to waterproof it. And so we got that idea of covering, but it appears now that there were two uh, homonyms, two different words in Hebrew, Kafar meaning to cover, which is what we have in Genesis, and then a second word spelled the same way, which has the idea of cleansing. And in fact, when you go to the Septuagint, which is the Jewish translation of the Old Testament that was uh, translated in the second century B.C. by the Jews in Alexandria, the rabbis there who knew, knew Hebrew, who were doing the translation, translated this word um, kafar with the Greek word katharizo in numerous cases, not every case, but in numerous cases they translated katharizo, which is the Greek word for cleanse. That's the same word we have in 1 John 1, 9, that we're cleansed from all unrighteousness. So <coughs> the emphasis on atonement has to do with cleansing, whether it's positional cleansing when a person first becomes a believer, or whether it's post-salvation cleansing, dealing with sins that are committed after salvation. Now, at verse 13 is where we have the end of the discussion on the 
uh, sin offering, verse 14, we go into the next section on the trespass offering. This is covered in Leviticus chapter 5, verses 15 down through 19. And then in the first part of Leviticus chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, we have the procedure given for the priest as to how he is to uh, carry out this particular sacrifice. The trespass offering is also called a guilt offering or a reparation offering, a guilt offering or a reparation offering. Sometimes people get confused. Well, if the fourth offering is a is a sin offering, how does that differ from a trespass offering? Aren't sin and trespass synonyms? And they are. And so uh, the word here in the Hebrew is asham, A-S-H-A-M, and it has to do with guilt, restitution, or expiation. So it is sometimes translated as a reparation or a restitution Offering The main idea of asham centers on the reality of guilt. But it is more than just the act of doing something wrong. It emphasizes the condition of guilt that exists from violation of law. So it indicates a status of guilt being under guilt. This is a condition of every human being because of Adam's original sin. Because of Adam's sin, because that is imputed to every human being, we are all legally guilty and violators of God's character. So we're all under sin and under the guilt of sin. And so that guilt, not guilt feelings, not feel, not emotion, but the reality of being legally guilty has to be dealt with. And so this is dealt with, of course, permanently on the cross. The sin offering itself focuses on two things, sins against God and sins against... um, Well, the sin offering, as we looked at before, deals with sins against God, whereas the guilt offering deals with sins against God and mankind. In uh, chapter 5, verse 15, we read, If a person commits a trespass and sins unintentionally, so it also deals with unintentional sins, sins unintentionally in regard to the holy things of the Lord. So this could involve any aspect of the Mosaic law that dealing with an unintentional sin. So there is the presence of guilt. But other examples that are given also relate to sins against other Uh, individuals. In chapter 6, verses uh, 1 through 7, we have further development of the the guilt offering. And in chapter 6, verses uh, 1 and following, or chapter, uh, verse 2 rather, if a person sins and commits a trespass against the Lord by lying to his neighbor about what was delivered to him for safekeeping or about a pledge or about robbery or if he is extorted from his neighbor. So again, this is a principle related to the commandment about false witness. You have given your word about something and you violate that, a pledge in relation to something financial. And it also relates to the sanctity of private property, which is at the foundation of all freedom. Recently I was talking with a... uh, pastor friend of mine, and he was relating to me a conversation he had with someone we both knew, and this person said, well, who should I vote for in the election? I'm not sure who I should vote for. And his response was, well, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but always remember that the key to freedom is private ownership of property. And whoever is going to allow you to keep the most of your property, what you have worked for, is the person you should vote for. (laughs) You've got to keep your eye on the ball, private ownership of property. So the Bible reinforces that. I don't think you can say that the Bible uh, is a handbook on capitalism, but the Bible teaches the principles of private ownership of property And that is the foundation of the system that we have that is known, the modern system that is known as capitalism or free enterprise. And 
the Bible also emphasizes the fact that people have a right to have what they should have. And unfortunately, when government comes along, God, in two great passages, 1 Samuel 7 uh, and a couple of other passages in Judges, emphasizes the fact that when you have a large government, then government takes away from people, increases taxes, raises taxes, and people have less property, and therefore they have less freedom. And this was what our founding fathers understood as we're approaching the season of 4th of July and Independence Day. Our founding fathers understood this principle, and that's why they made such an issue out of taxation without representation. And yet the level of taxation that they were subject to by the British Empire was minuscule compared to the level of taxation that the average citizen of the United States is uh, is faced with on a day-to-day basis. Uh, we need to go back and apologize to George III for our little tax revolt because uh, today we really don't care. We want to give up all of our freedoms and let the government decide how to spend everything. And um, somebody was telling me today that they had heard on the news that the latest uh, legislative agenda is to um, to make it uh, to to pass legislation against drive-through windows. Can't have drive-through windows at Starbucks or Burger King or Whataburger or any place like that because see all these people who are just sitting there and idling their cars and waiting in line are just putting all of this exhaust into the atmosphere, and um, that's causing global warming. So see, it's all you people who are getting your morning coffee at Starbucks and going through the drive through That's your fault. See, this is we're manufacturing problems, and it just once again we expect the government to dictate everything. And you know, we laugh because we have knowledge of truth, and so we realize how absolutely ridiculous it is. But the sad thing is, the huge number of people who listen to this and go, "Oh yeah, well that must be right." So let's just all give up our freedoms and let the government, you know, take care of everything. Well, I'm getting off subject. Private ownership of property, though, is clearly recognized in the Scripture as something that needs to be protected. And when it's not, and an individual uh, lies about or breaks the pledge, extorts money, anything of that, then there should be a uh, trespass offering. Verse 4. It shall be because he has sinned and he is guilty that he shall restore what he has stolen. And I want you to notice that in the penalties in the Mosaic Law, and we could spend a lot of time on this and I won't, but in the penalties in the Mosaic Law, you don't have imprisonment as a penalty. I think imprisonment is probably a pretty inhumane type of punishment. What you have in the Mosaic Law is restitution. And so if somebody steals or defrauds or destroys property, then they have to restore what they have stolen plus 20%. If they've committed murder or rape or some other kinds of violent crime, then they forfeit their life. So you have capital punishment and restitution, but you don't have imprisonment. That is not part of the Mosaic Law. They had other forms of punishment, and this punishment was swift and certain, or was intended to be. So, as you go through the uh, sin, or excuse me, the guilt offering, you emphasize the fact that these are perhaps unintentional sins. In other cases, they are sins of of culpability, and the solution is rest- restitution plus twenty percent, along with the payment of a guilt offering, a ram without defect. So, this they don't get the alternative here; they get the uh, it's a more expensive form of uh, payment. The offering is a ram without defect or the uh, financial equivalent plus in some plus one fifth another twenty percent for for the priest. So these offerings, especially the last two, the sin offering and the guilt offering, emphasize the fact that there is. The restitution with our fellowship with God, even when there is sin, but the sin has an effect on that relationship with God. Now, let's stop a minute and think about um, Israel as a whole. As a nation, 
they are analogous to the individual believer in the church age. So that as a nation, they are viewed in the Old Testament after the Exodus as redeemed people, as we would say they're saved. And so all of these offerings and sacrifices are designed to allow a redeemed people, a saved people, to continue, maintain fellowship with God after salvation. So it's a picture of the fact that even in the Old Testament, God is emphasizing the fact that sin experientially breaks fellowship with God and those who are experientially unrighteous cannot have fellowship with God who is righteous. And God gets pretty serious about demonstrating this point. I want you to turn with me to the book of Joshua, three or four books over, to Joshua chapter, if I can find it, Joshua 4. 7, Joshua 7. Now, this is after the victory at Jericho. Now, in the instructions that God gave to Israel, when they were attacked Jericho, he put under the ban, and the word there is the word harem in the Hebrew. It's the same word you have in Arabic for the harem, uh, where the you would set apart in a protected or isolated status, all of the wives of the sultan. That's the harem, same word. It means to set something aside and uh, make it inviolable. So this is uh, the instruction that God gave to Israel. Now, in verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 17, Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, and all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all those who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you partake of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. So all that which is valuable, the valuable plunder that you take, that gets set apart for the Lord for the treasury of the Lord. And everything else was under the ban. Verse 21, they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. Everything was supposed to be slaughtered because God wasn't going to have them survive and live off of the uh, that which was produced by the pagan culture. So this is the command. They are to destroy everything. But they don't do that. Verse 1 of chapter 7, But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed thing. Notice, the children of Israel, the nation, is impacted by the sin of one man, Achan. Because he disobeys God, and what he does is when he sees his plunder, he decides that he's going to dig a hole under his tent and bury it, and he's going to make off with some of the plunder, and nobody else knows about that. But yet the whole nation is held accountable for that sin. So the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, blah, 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 took the the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. The result was when they go out to the next battle at Ai, they go into battle and they completely fail. They sent up two or 3,000 men to go up and attack, and they, because of sin in the camp, they fail, and they are completely defeated. And verse 5, we read, The men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shevarim, struck them down the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. So now they've had this great victory at Jericho, and now they're just completely discouraged in their whining. And it's not just some of them. It's all the way up the chain of command to Joshua. And Joshua turns around and turns to God. And verse 7 says, Alas, God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites? What are you doing? Joshua tears his clothes. He falls to the uh, ground before the ark. And he says he's, he's completely at a loss. So God responds to him in verse 10. So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up, 
Why do you lie thus on your face? Joshua ought to know better, so God is reprimanding him. It says, Israel has sinned, and they have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Now, the only one who has done this is Achan. But it shows that the sin of one affects and permeates everyone so that we often try to convince ourselves at times that my sin is my sin. It really doesn't have any impact on anybody else. And the principle that this is showing is that the sin of the individual does have impact on others. Adam's sin had an impact on the entire human race. So there's a solution. Verse 13, get up, sanctify the people. That means they have to go through a process of cleansing because of this sin. Otherwise, they can't go forward in the conquest of the land. Get up, sanctify the people and say, and this is the command that Joshua is to give them, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow because thus says the Lord God of Israel, there's an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. So there has to be, the sin has to be dealt with. There has to be a, an admission of the guilt and cleansing that takes place. So the next morning they come out and they go through this, uh, this whole process of elimination. And they gather all of the tribes before, uh, before Joshua. And in some way God communicates which uh, tribe it's going to be, and the tribe of Judah is indicated. And then uh, when Judah is brought before him, then the family of the Zarhites, and then the family of Zabdiel is indicated, and then finally comes down to Achan, and Achan is indicated. And so Joshua confronts him with his sin in verse 19 and says, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done Do not hide it from me. And so Achan answers Joshua and says, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord. That's his confession of sin. I've sinned against the Lord. This is what I have done. And then he explains in verse 21 what he has done. But the divine discipline, the judgment, is not going to be removed. There's forgiveness. Sometimes when we confess our sin, God forgives us and removes the punishment. Sometimes God just lightens the punishment. Other times we can commit a sin and we can receive divine forgiveness, but because of the nature of the sin, there still must be the carrying out of the penalty. Now, this happens in the cases where you have uh, a criminal who's committed murder, mass murder, any number of different horrendous uh, crimes, and they receive the death penalty. And I remember there was a case about 10 years ago with Carla Faye Tucker, and she became a believer after she was in prison. And so you had all these pastors who came out and said, oh, we need to let her, let her live and, you know, don't give her the death penalty. But the Scripture says that there are certain she, – she committed a crime – And just because she changed her spiritual status doesn't mean that the legal penalty goes away. There's a difference between personal forgiveness, divine forgiveness, and legal or criminal forgiveness. And in this case, there could be personal forgiveness, there could be divine forgiveness, but a legal penalty still had to be paid. And that's the case with Achan. The legal penalty still had to be paid. And so the penalty, as defined by God, was that, back in verse 15, it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire. See, that's the picture of cleansing and purification. He shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and done a disgraceful thing in Israel. So in verse 24... Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, uh, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had. This includes his family. And they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel, excuse me, didn't even know I had that with me. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Now that's a good double punishment. 
First they stone him, and then they burn him with fire. So there, there's that, that pig, the burning with fire, though, is the depiction of purification uh, from the sin. So verse 26, then they raised over him a great heap of stones still there to this day. And so the writer adds that uh, point that those that rock cairn is still there that sat over his grave. So if you doubt the story, you can go down there and you can find that pile of rocks marking his grave. And all, so the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of the place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. So the point is that God takes sin a lot more seriously than we do. And when we have sin in the life, it hinders our our forward advance spiritually. This is why the Israelites couldn't go forward with their military campaign. And the sin has to be dealt with. Cleansing has to be dealt with. And once that's done, then we can move forward. So even though this is an Old Testament illustration in the, in the sin offering and the trespass offering. And it's an illustration from Achor. The same principle continues into the New Testament. And you have uh, various commands such as 1 Corinthians 11 where the Corinthians are coming to the Lord's table. They're out of fellowship. They're abusing the Lord's table, getting drunk, and they're overeating at the Lord's table. And Paul says that for this reason many of you are weak, indicating spiritual weakness, and sickly, indicating a physical sickness, and many of you sleep, indicating sin unto death. And then Paul said, therefore, let us examine ourselves. So that is a, another uh, synonym for confession of sin. And, of course, there's 1 John 1, 9 and other passages in the New Testament that emphasize the importance of this cleansing so that the believer is, is experientially sanctified before he comes into the presence of God. So next time we'll come back and we'll see the illustration in the next piece of furniture, which is the uh, laver. And we'll get into that next week. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study these things, to be reminded of the fact that sin seriously hinders our, not only our spiritual growth, but our relationship with you. And that because you are a righteous God, a God of uh, holiness and integrity, that this sin must be dealt with. And you have given us a grace provision in the principle of confession that simply by admitting or acknowledging our sin based on what Christ did on the cross, we are instantly forgiven and cleansed of all sin. Father, we pray that you would encourage us with what we've learned about these things as we continue to advance in our spiritual life. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.